Oh, snap. Oh, shit. There he is. The Cuban king of sandwiches. And the fucking Uber driver of comedy. <laughs> you must have drove hey, 2,000 miles the last two days, plus the five-day. I, I give it to you. I forgot how much driving there. No, I'm lying to you. I never forgot how much driving there is in comedy. Oh, see, and, and you know what? And like I, I've thought about like we've talked about the triple runs, and I wish I could do them. They don't. They just don't exist. But at least with him, twelve hours a day seems like a lot. But like a good four hour drive. Like I'm going to Syracuse in like three weeks, and they don't pay for a hotel, so I'm just gonna go back and forth. It's four hours each I way. Mean, yeah. No, no, that's eight hours. Just get. I like a four-hour drive. You don't like a four-hour drive? Not when you're leaving the club at twelve and you get home at four. Your back is going to go to shit, Lee. Okay, all right. That's a bit. You know, if it was an hour, hour and a half, like San Diego's the farthest. Right. (laughs) Hour and a half, hour thirty-seven. You know. (laughs) I was going to say most people take two plus, but (laughs) for you, (laughs) hour thirty-seven. If you're leaving the club, it's an hour thirty-seven. If, okay. You know, that's something different. But for you to get in the car at 1130 on a Friday night and drive four and then four at the end and then four. How many nights is it? Just one night. Oh, it's just one night. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh no, I wouldn't go back and forth. Yeah. I'm not that crazy. I'm not that cheap. Even still, get yourself a little cheap hotel room. I'll have to see. I'll find something. You know, first off, you don't want to drive four hours and go to the club. Your asshole is going to smell like fucking death. <laughs> So you want to relax for two hours, take a shower, right? watch TV, get everything off your mind, and then attack it. Okay. And if you want to drive home, that's something different. But somewhere along the line, you're going to have to get a hotel room. Okay. I, you know, it's four hours, you're sweaty. I don't, I don't know why you're assuming I'll be sweaty. <laughs> because I've seen the humps. <laughs> oh, I, dude... I almost have to throw the underwear away after like a road trip. Yeah. It's, I'm disgusting. Like, I won't shower. I'll just get in the car with like gym shorts. But I do love like a pre show shower. That is pretty awesome. Pre show shower when you get home from the hotel. You know, if you're doing a show with 40 people, it don't matter. But we were doing those theater shows and I'm talking to 500 people and you got to go home and take a shower. Really? You'd go to a late night shower too. Okay. I, oh yeah. First thing, take my clothes, not even sit on the bed with that clothes on. Wow. You just had two thousand people at a theater. You just had, you know, six hundred people at a show. You talked to three hundred of them. You did that twice. That's people breathing on your neck. That's headshots. That's people putting their fucking greasy hair on your neck and you putting it on their neck. You know, that's a lot of contact. Yeah. I did you always want to go home and take a nice hot shower, scrub real good, have a little meal waiting for you at Law & Order. Ooh. Ooh. On a Friday night, a couple of Law & Orders, you eat your meal, you go outside, you smoke a joint, you call Athena, you go back to your room, and it's fucking you against the world in a hotel room, and you got nowhere to go in the morning. I live my favorite night. There's no better feeling than that. That's yeah. what I'm saying to you. You have to be prepared for that next level. For you to get home after a show and not take a decent shower and cut your toenails and <laughs> <clears throat> fucking put ice on your knees, whatever hurts, you know. I used to do that all the time. You would ice your knees? Yeah. And Because I, I just started getting into... You've been on your legs for three hours. Right. Yeah. You I'm know? only doing, I guess what I'm doing, I was thinking about that. Like as a he- when you start headlining, like my in my head, because I just started getting into I have I had like three massages so far, like an actual like real like you go and get in like and and it's like my favorite thing. And I I, I was always creeped out by someone else touching me, but like it, I, that's in my head when I start headlining, I'm gonna do that once. Like I'm hoping to do it once a week. Like, is there anything that you would do on the road to like take care of yourself other than like knees or? You know, for the first. I mean, from two th- from ninety one to two thousand four, I never peaked in the hotel gym. <laughs> like I went on the road to destroy myself, you know. Right. And then once I started getting healthy and going to Weight Watchers, I started when I look at a hotel when they send you the itinerary, you know, they better have a fucking 
gym. Mm -hmm. I don't need a pool. I don't need none of that shit. I just need a gym. You know, I don't need a bench press. All I need is a stand master, a bike, and a couple of weights, and you can make it work for a half hour, 50, 45 minutes. And then I started actually doing something. Okay. Eating, I would go to towns and go to kickboxing class. Oh, shit. Oh, yeah. I, I would forgot you packed your gi a little bit. Once in a while, but that's not good for jujitsu because you're seeing these animals and they're fucking killing you. On a Saturday, I don't have the time to go to jujitsu class, break my wrist, and call the theater and tell them I'm not coming or the comedy right. club. Right. You know, so you have to consider all those things. But I would get up early on a Saturday and go do a kickboxing class at some Muay Thai place, and people would freak out. Oh, like, I can't even imagine what they'd think. What the fuck are you doing here? And I'm like, you want to get this out on work out there a little bit, you know? I got into that. I got into finding like a nice local spot in town, not like uh, a Morton Steakhouse or a Fogo de Chao. Okay. Switching it up a little bit. And that became fun, searching a restaurant out and taking an Uber. That's fun, you know? Oh, but, I love it. But then there's days in the hotel where I do go back on Friday night. You stay up till three. Yeah. You wake up at eight. You go get a good breakfast, smoke a joint, go for a walk. And by 930, you're back in bed. You know, there's always a good movie on a Rambo, a Rocky, a Clint Eastwood movie, and you just fall asleep. And then you wake up like about one, one thirty. Right. And those days you don't go to kickboxing. <laughs> no, fuck kickboxing. Uh, go outside, you get coffee, you smoke a joint, you take a shower, and then you ask somebody, what's a nice restaurant that isn't a chain? Like somebody local that's put the time in. You know, you want to go support them. Oh, yeah. Like that's, and I get it. Like Danny Braff and I were talking about this. We rode from one gig to another. And we were talking about like how it's crazy when you meet who headliners who are unhappy being headliners and being on the road. And like, we're just like that to me, the days you just described sound like heaven to me, like going to get food, relaxing in a hotel, smoking it. Like that sounds like if I could win a, a lottery, like it, that just sounds awesome. Listen, man, when you're doing it, you're in love. You, I was telling you in the car the other day that comedy full time for me is a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you what, because you got to be in love with it. You got to right. be married to it. You have to be, you know, I mean, listen, comedy marriages don't end well. Oh, uh, yeah. No, think about it. A, a lot of comics have been married multiple times, myself included, but I, I wasn't doing comedy. <clears throat> when I first got married, I was just a fucking personal mess. But, you know, you meet a comedian at a club, you sleep with him, he takes you for a date, you know, you start being his girlfriend. The whole year and a half, you're in ether. You know, you're telling your friends, oh my God, I, he's so fun. And the girl's like, how do you keep it together being around him? And then you get married to a comic. And that's a big fucking mistake. And I'm going to tell, <laughs> tell you why. From uh, We don't know what we're doing. We're in a fucking, we're selling out clubs and, you know, agents are calling you to do movies. And you're really not focused on everything. And you just marry this girl. And she marries you. And then, God forbid, you have a kid with her. And now it's not what it used to be. You're not selling the tickets you used to. You're older, so now you got to work a little harder. And think about it. if I would think about a woman with a kid, mm -hmm. two kids, and you're married to them. It's not like you're dating them; you're married to them. And you call them, and they're like, well, you know, they're like, "What's going on with you?" And you're like, "I'm on the golf course. I'm playing golf with Rich Voss and this guy and that guy." And then that night, you call them again and go, "Guess who came to my show tonight? Prince." <laughs> you know, fucking girl is sitting at home with a child. Right. She can only take so much of that, you know, especially if we do it three weeks at a time at a clip, you know, it, it, it wears on you, man. So it, they get divorced. Now, it wasn't her fault and it wasn't his fault. 
He didn't know that he was in love with comedy. He was married to comedy first. He had no idea. And she, you know, it's and then they get mad at each other, whatever. When you're a comic and you're in it to win it, you're married. You're fucking yeah. married. It's it's a whole different romance. You know, it's a whole fucking different romance. And now you want to open up your life to more romance. Let somebody else find out and for you to find out that this is a mistake. I can't do this shit, be husband. I'm married to comedy. What the fuck am I going to do at a softball game with kids? When I was in it to win it, I couldn't sit at a softball game with kids. I don't care if all nine of my kids were playing on the team. <laughs> You know, I, I, I got to make people laugh. It's Friday night. It's right. Saturday night, you know. Now I sit there and I go, oh, thank God I'm not on the stage getting an ear beaten from a sound guy. So how long are you doing? <laughs> Every 10 minutes. How long are you doing? Listen, get the fuck out. You know, people have no idea. Like, and for me, it just got repetitive. Mm -hmm. Like, it got really repetitive. I loved it the whole time. But it got to the point I didn't want to. The first thing that started going was Saturdays. Because, that what you you didn't you couldn't enjoy them. Well, you go to the gym, you meet the other comic, you eat lunch, you go for a walk, you get back to your room at two o'clock. And for me, listen, when I didn't have a family, who gives a fuck? I go back to the room at two and light my balls on fire, <laughs> eight till seven. But then you call home. Right. I see that. And that's the day all the kids are out. They're having a great time. And you're in a hotel room with the shades drawn because it's too beautiful out. You already did what you had to do. Now you got five hours to wait. And that, for me, became hell. After the lunch was over, after the workout was done, after the great breakfast, you know, two eggs, fucking Four pieces of bacon, a piece of seven grain toast, maybe a smoothie or something. That's it. So the, the Saturday started getting, but that's 25 years of Saturdays. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? 25 years of Saturdays. But there was a time I couldn't imagine not working a Saturday <clears throat> or a Sunday. I like I like doing comedy on a Sunday. If I have to drive down the corner. I don't want to be on the road on a Sunday. That's too much commitment on a Sunday. Big differences. Right. It's funny that you're like comparing it to a relationship because like when you said that, I all I could think of is like, you know, when you first start dating someone and you're just even when they text you, you're excited, or when you see them, like it's just, with comedy, like I'm six years in, but I'm still like, if anyone texts me about comedy or like a show, or like, that's how excited I get. Oh yeah. This is it. Anybody who contacts you the first six years about comedy, you get so fucking excited. You know, it, it gives you little rooms. You're going to get robbed. But oh, yeah. Yeah, you don't care because you're doing what you were supposed to be doing. You're doing what you wanted to do. It, it's such a great feeling, you know? It really is. It, and it's like, it, it's, I'll, y'all think about it all day. Like, I, some guy asked me to, like, from, some guy just asked me for my avails and I'm emailing people every day. No one responds to me. And someone, some guy just asked me out of the blue and it's just like, Oh shit, this is the best yeah. day of my life. Because you're putting the work in, you know, every day you're sending an email. If nobody gets back to you after 12 emails, somebody will get back to you. Maybe not the guys you're emailing, but just somebody. Why? Because you're putting out, you're putting it out into the world. It's when you don't do that. That you're like, nobody fucking calls me for comedy. Well, you don't put no feelers out either. Right. That, yeah. That's a complete different part of comedy. That's a complete booking yourself and all that and the strategy and how you work people. That's a complete different thing. It's funny you said that. I was talking to Aaron Berg the other night. Okay. At the dojo and... It was so weird, this thing I started. You sit there in a hotel all day. So you might as well make some calls, send some faxes, make a flyer, you know, for the following week. I mean, I don't know how to make a flyer, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Someone else could. Like MySpace or something like that, you know? Yeah. And, but I still remember it. 
like I, I've been sending fax. Like now, if you got a fax, people think you're fucking a dinosaur. But I was sending faxes on Mondays and Tuesdays from maybe ninety four. Okay. To aggressively, once I got to Seattle, I had it down. I would bother everybody on Monday and Tuesday. Everybody got a call. And the call started at 9.01. There's no reason to wait till 9. You got to get them early, wake them up out of bed, let them know you're not fucking around. Yeah. And I would start Monday at 9. And then I'd have a fat fax go out to 20 other numbers. If somebody was, I was working with somebody, he was a feature. He goes, yeah, this guy in my hometown in Iowa, you got to fax him on Mondays. Even though I didn't want to go to Iowa, I would fax him. Would you really? Yeah, I would fax. Why not? We offered you a gig. Then I'll call you later, and then fucking move on with your life. I'm gonna drive to Oklahoma or Iowa. I don't know. I'm in Seattle, Washington. <clears throat> but that's because you're just putting out numbers, right? It's fucking numbers. It goes back to it all is a numbers game, you know. I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to ask you this, but that day that I got the headlining gig, like a week or two ago. I wish I wasn't, but I'm a believer. Or like when you see eleven eleven, I I'm an idiot. I make a wish, and I look. I look. I have one that I do, and I ask for things for certain people. And I was talking about headlining, and like literally five minutes later, I got the call. And I know this is not a feeler, like this is, but like I don't know. It was just so. It was creepy. It really is when you start thinking about something, and this is all based on work, guys. You know, and you know this, that there's so many moving parts when you're a comic. Mm -hmm. If you neglect one, you're going to be fucked. There's writing, there's promoting yourself, there's getting shows, there's, you know, looking at your material and seeing what's 30 minutes, what's 15, what's 45. There's so many moving fucking parts. You learn, you know, I never knew what we were. Until I saw I saw Roseanne and Larry King live. What did what did that happen? What happened? Had to be 50, let's say fifteen years ago. Okay. That conversation I saw her have with Larry King changed my outlook on comedy. Larry King asked her about. She threw after she became number one on ABC in the nineties. Right. At the Christmas party, she threw all the ABC execs out of the party. She wouldn't let him in. Good. And he asked her, why did you do that? And he goes, this is my reasoning. You forget who you are as a comic. But when you're a comic, you do it all. That's why it never shocks me when a good comic is a great director. It never shocks me when a great comic is a great actor. You know, Robin Williams, a lot of comedians are great. Because we do so many things. We produce, we write, we direct, we perform. We're the MC. We're everything. Yeah. We're everything. You know, you said to me the last time we did the dojo, you go, that's really weird that you host on those nights. Mm-hmm. You know, and I don't know where I got it from, but I do know how to make a show a show. Yeah. I do know how to look at a show and go, how can we make this the best show? Pop? Listen, even if I don't make a lot of money, I like a show that's fucking jam-packed. I'd rather give away the money and produce a fucking great show than get a bunch of open micers and me keep the money. Right, yeah, because like the shows at the dojo have been a blast, and it's it was scary when I found out you were hosting. I was like, "Fuck, I have to follow Joey," but no, it, good, like, you, you, you do it in a way that like isn't burying us. No, I'm not looking to bury nobody. I'm looking as a host on those shows. I'm the one that puts pepper and salt on the show on each comic. Okay, I'm the one that marinates. Because you're not going up there to follow me. You're going up there for me to give you energy 
and love. It's completely different. It's not like I'm doing a show with a bunch of strangers. This is my family. You guys, you know. So I don't mind that. I don't mind losing money on those nights to give them the best show in the world. We got Plantabus to come in and sponsor. Yeah, it was a awesome. Dispensary, you know, out of Rawway, great dispensary, you know. The joint was great. Yeah, everything they have is great. What did Athena think of that weed? Oh, loved it. Loved yeah. that. The, the weed you had this week, like I told you, I, I, I don't know if I ever had a bong hit that lasted for like four hours. That weed that we smoked this week was tremendous. And we went back yesterday and they were sold out of everything. Yeah. And it there was, was Mama Kush by Garden Greens. And it was Verano Cherry Lime Kush or something. That's the first thing we smoked. When you came in and you were like, what the fuck? <laughs> Your fucking whole emotional changes. And then oh. Saturday, I busted out. Or Friday, I busted out the Obama run. So Thursday or Friday. And that even took us fucking deeper into It's really weird how I plugged into weed here now. I know that I got a couple companies now. I know what they got. And I'm good. I don't have to worry about California no more getting it sent. It's fucking a great relief. Oh yeah, and I'm like Denver and, and or Colorado and California have great weed, but like, do you think it's at the point now where like you could find great weed almost everywhere? Well, these companies that I buy from were originally California companies. Okay. When the licenses and the legalization came, they came to Jersey and they growed and they kept to their who they were. Somebody gave me a sample of weed for me to work with them. This shit was pure tumbleweed. I had to send them that <laughs> weed. I had to send them a picture of the cherry lime and go, this is weed. That's you sent it to the company? Huh? You sent it to the original company, like a different weed? Oh, yeah. I'm like, guys, <laughs> because what's happened is businessmen have taken over the THC business. Right. It's become more profit-based for these fucking knuckleheads, and they know nothing about weed. Like, I would never invest in something that I knew nothing about. And it was made more evident to me when I went to Carvel in, Bev in uh, Beverly Hills, whatever the fuck it is. Yeah, yeah. And the people, it was an investment. And it hurt my feelings. If I was going to own a Carvel store, I grew up in a Carvel store. If I was going to buy a Dairy Queen, I grew up in a Dairy Queen. If I'm going to buy a crispy pizza chain, it's because I eat crispy pizzas, not because I eat fucking Domino's and want to sell crispy pizza. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, Absolutely. <laughs> investments now they have money so they invest and they don't give a fuck about the finished product they don't and that's what that's why the denver weed market has gone to the fucking toilet oh the, really the corporations came in too many business people and they tried to make weed corporate no you don't you buy the company and you leave the fucking hippies in they're the ones that have been doing this for 30 years you've been selling construction things and fucking pipes and you sold your company and now you got 50 million and i i respect you but this isn't what you do you just right. want to jump on the ba weed ban bandwagon now to make a profit and it's dog you gotta you know if i put on any product it's gotta be like knocking my socks off i don't even want to tell you how much they offered me for an edible oh like, jesus and i gotta tell you i don't want to put a gummy out Really? No. I'm mad flavor. I'm not going to come out. I'm going to come out with a spray, an eye patch, a fucking, you know. I want to come out with something different, something that's 2024. Right. Everybody's got a gummy, and they all taste like rotten ass. That's true. They all taste like rotten Finally, ass. Finally, you admit it. I've been saying that for a decade. You tell me it tastes delicious. Listen, some of them are delicious. Like, we ate some Saturday night that you could taste the weed and it was sour and all that shit. But there's some edibles that are mild. And you um, eat them, they, they do the trick. Right. You know, they do the trick, but I just wanted I wanted to do something different. I'm really interested in this thousand milligram THC spray <laughs> that you spray in your fucking throat and you see the devil 22 minutes later. I don't think it would take 22 minutes. What if you could get like something implanted, like a little implant that like has THC and you could just press a button and it goes into your bloodstream? That would be tremendous. 
Hell yeah, that would be awesome. And you press it three times and it just <laughs> blows up in your fucking head. <laughs> you can't talk for four days. Let's get this fucking show started, Jack. Hey, it's Tuesday, the 25th of June. The check-in is brought to you by Blue Chew. Listen, we all know it's not about the size of the boat. It's the motion of the ocean. So let Blue Chew help you get shipwrecked. Blue Chew gets your dick hard. So you can have great sex. It's as simple as that, right? They're an online service that sends ED medicine to your door. The tablets are chewable, taste like mint, and will get you in the mood in no time. Tip, top, magoo. It's got the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but at a fraction of the price. You can't mess this up. Listen, it's summertime. Everybody wants to slink things in the summer. Everybody wants to be... John Travolta and the chick from Greece in the summer. But, you know, sometimes you drink, sometimes the sun, your dick don't work that good. You always want to be prepared. Whether you're 20 or fucking 60, you want to be ready for war at all times. It's easy. Getting started is really easy with Blue Chew. Just head to bluechew.com, talk to one of the licensed medical providers, and if you're approved, you'll have a prescription in days. They send it right to your door, and even your mailman don't know what's in the box. Nobody will know what's in that magic box. Only you, when your smile lights up and going, oh, my God, I'm going to a slinging dick festival. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it, Jack. Check-in listeners can try Blue Chew free. What are you talking about, Joey? Free when you press in promo code Diaz at checkout. D-I-A-Z, and you just pay $5 for shipping. Who's better than Blue Chew? Nobody. That's why BlueChew.com, promo code Diaz, D-I-A-Z, to receive your first month for free. And trust me, after you get that first month and you see how great life is, you'll be a Blue Chew fan for life. So visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And I want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the show and spreading the love. Support the show and try Blue Chew for free. Just $5 for shipping. Use promo code Diaz. Let's get this show started, fellas. Turn off your TVs. Run for your lives. It's over. They didn't put you on this planet just to give up. If Uncle Joey could do it, I can rule the world. That's what you got to be thinking. Welcome back to It's a beautiful Tuesday morning. What up, Mook? What's up, buddy? It was great to see you this week. Great to see you. We smoked some good weed. We ate that. We drank that. That's what killed my stomach. I've been sick for four days. You've been saying that. I have not. I didn't do anything today. Last night was the worst of all the nights. I had to get up at 4.30 in the morning. Oh, to take a shit? Everything. And then I puked at about 5.30 outside. I didn't oh, drink no. Coffee. I didn't even drink coffee today. That sucks, dude. What the fuck? I missed jujitsu today. I slept like three hours. I slept from like 10 to like 12. And then I went back up about three and slept till like five. Yeah, but you, that, that means you're not feeling well. We got to bounce back. You know what I'm saying? We're going to be fine. If tomorrow I feel the same way, I'll make a doctor's appointment. Right. Tights have been like a third, you know? That. Anything with your stomach sucks, dude. That that's awful. It does. It does suck, and it just uh, it just bummed me out a little bit. You know what I'm saying? But it's Tuesday. No reason to be bummed out. Hell no. Take care of this shit. I had a great time seeing you. Fucking. You know what I was thinking about the other night when we came home on the mushroom liquid? <laughs> yeah. We smoked that <laughs> weed and super, and Superfly was on. Oh, Jesus Christ. The original from 1972 with uh, Curtis Mayfield and uh, I forget the actor's name, O'Neill, Ryan O'Neill, maybe. How fucking crazy was that? I've been dying to watch that for three years. Three or four years, I'm like, when am I going to watch Superfly? 
and it was on the other night because it was like Black uh, History Night on uh, Turner Classic Movies. Right. It was Superfly, Shaft, and then Late Night was fucking Blackula. Gee, yeah, because because uh, whatever it's called, Superfly ended at two in the morning. So yeah, Black, Jesus, I had yeah. never, I'd never seen anything like Superfly. I still, no. to those be honest, are, don't really know what I saw. Those are the black exploitation movies of nineteen seventy, and they were buck wild because they had to hit their audiences. You know, there's a scene in that at the end when we were watching because I wanted to watch the ending is great, right? <clears throat> and he meets with the the narcotic cop and the guy's threatening him and Superfly is talking to him and he's like, I don't want to do it and stuff. And then he goes off on him. But before he goes off on him, I've never seen that before. He takes a bag of Coke out and he does two huge blasts right in front of the cop. And then he does the other one. And then he just starts going off him. I'll pimp your daughter. I'll kill your fucking cat. You know, he just starts saying all this shit and then he fights him. And his fuck, he's got, he's got like the James Brown hair, and somebody pulls it and shit. And it looks like you know. Is he the one that has like the triangle beard too? It comes to like a point on the sides. He had a beard too. He was a, good, has he was a very good looking dude at that time. But the sex scene we saw with the chick's ass was tremendous. I don't know what that was. The mushrooms had taken me for a fucking spin. Yeah, they were just having sex, and then they showed pretty much everything. And th- but it was like it was just so like I'd never seen a style like that. Like they just had scenes. It was almost like the first time you gave me an edible, I saw Friday, and like I was so high I could see them acting. I could see the, the director say action, and I felt like it was like that with Superfly because I felt like they like left a, like a a shot a little bit too long, or like they started it. It was way back. You couldn't hear them sometimes. I was like, what the fuck is happening? 52 years ago, that movie came out. So much has happened in movies and films, the options you have. But those are the movies I grew up on. Yeah. And I hold them close to my heart. And listen, when you watch them now, you're like, what <laughs> the fuck am I watching? Like, what was I thinking at eight years old watching this in the movie theater? Oh, dude, at eight years old. That's like, you don't even know that that's a real, those are human beings. You like, know. <laughs> doing coke? Are you serious? The, seeing a girl's ass? If I saw a girl's ass at eight, I probably would have exploded. Well, that movie came out when I was eight or nine. Yeah. And I didn't, you know, at the time I was going to Catholic school. And we, we got out on the weekends like prisoners and we went back <laughs> on Sunday nights. So on Sunday nights, you're at all the activities with kids. Now, a lot of these kids were well off, but a lot of them were from the Bronx and Brooklyn, and they were urban, and they were black and Puerto Rican, and they would tell us about their weekend, and their weekends were a lot better. You know, when you're at that age, your parents just give you two bucks and tell you to go to the movies. You know, That's pretty awesome. And you go to the movies, and if they have a rated next movie, you watch it. If they have a Spanish movie, you watch it. Whatever the fuck they you watch, you watch. And I still remember at that time, kids were coming back every Sunday with stories about movies. And we all were going to movies. But like I was going to see The Mechanic in 73 and Hard Times in 72 and the Veloci papers. And that's what we were talking about. We weren't talking about fucking Disney movies at eight. I tell you that much. But I still remember kids going to see Superfly and going, oh, he was fucking badass. And like the first thing you do when you get out of, on Friday is go to the movies. Oh, to yeah. Fly or any other movie. But could you imagine now? Like imagine if you went to the movies with Mercy or not even with her, like just by yourself. And there was an eight year old in an R rated movie. You like you probably go get somebody. No, I would. No, no. No. <laughs> no. Why be a crime stopper? Listen, man, all those ages, I was watching all those movies. I watched The Longest Yard, the original at 10. I watched all those movies, and they helped my imagination. You know, I was a, an only child. They took me out, and it makes the kid feel a little special. That mm-hmm. all these little fucking buddies 
still go to see fucking the Avengers, and he's going to see a heavy-duty R-rated movie. When I took Mercy the first time to an R-rated movie, she didn't care what the movie was about. Really? She, was, she was just excited to be there? I take an R's all the time. But with you, with your dad, it's fucking cool. Yeah. What was it? What was the first already movie you, you showed her? I think like the Equalizer or something. We went, oh, okay. we went to a bunch of movies on Thursday nights. After you know, about two years ago, a bunch of movies had come out, and we would mm -hmm. go one Thursday a month. We get out of there like ten o'clock at night. Her mom would be like, "Where the fuck did you have her, <laughs> man? This is nobody wants to go to movies at two o'clock. I'd rather go at nine o'clock." Oh yeah, and movies. Like I remember, like my dad. That I feel like that's a dad thing to like take the and I, it was the best. I loved going to the movies. He'd fall asleep, and I would watch. I remember we I, the first R-rated movie I saw was Geronimo, and I just remember there was a big bull that the guy rode around. I don't remember anything else about it, but I knew it was an R-rated movie. Like so, like to do that, that I think is is cool. I think I'm just imagining a group of eight year old little boys with like little mini popcorns, ready to see Superfly by themselves. We used to go to the movies in groups all the time. Eight of us, seven of us, six of us to see a Bruce Lee movie or, you know, any other one, <laughs> any other type of stupidity we used to. <clears throat> Would you go crazy in the aisle? I just have this image of you doing like crazy. karate moves during Bruce Lee. Crazy. There was a few. I still remember seeing Rocky and The Longest Yard were the two movies that stick out the most where the audience was crazy. And then at like the age of 13, I walked into a black movie theater. Oh, nice. And that's a complete, if you go to Lowe's on 42nd or 51st and Broadway, I don't even know if there's a Lowe's there. I'm just making this up. Mm -hmm. I realized that if I went from 88th Street to a movie in Midtown, it was okay. The movie was great. But if I went from my godmother's house down the corner to see those movies that were in <clears throat> black areas. And those movies were always a lot better. There was people talking, you're giggling, you're laughing your ass off because you always get the one funny black dude. Oh, yeah. Says, what the fuck? You know, whatever. And you're eight. You're fucking giggling. Oh, that's because th there's a difference. If it's just one person doing it, they're being rude and annoying. But if the whole theater is having a good time, it'll make oh, a movie. God. Like, a full movie theater of Superfly would be way different, I bet. Like, all the kids going crazy. You've never seen an ass before. He's doing coke on screen. Like, if everyone's going nuts, that's a crazy movie. Like, I think the... the I saw two black movies later on that I remember specifically. I saw two movies in a black movie theater that I actually remember them going off. Oh, Yeah. The one movie theater was uh, in Harlem. I forget where. And I went to see The Last Dragon with uh, Bruce Leroy and all that shit. Nice. Black people were going off. Every time uh, the guy came on, the karate master, the crazy one. I think he just passed away a couple of years ago. That crazy dude. But if I tell you the number one movie where I saw black people... <laughs> go fucking insane that I left there going Woo, if Rocky ever got a slave he'd have 200 volunteers from that fucking movie theater because they <laughs> fuck love it. black people love Rocky dog they fucking love Rocky so I'll never forget Rocky 2 the one that came out in 85 this motherfucker is hunting Russians <laughs> that was all about the Russian, the Vietnamese, and the Russian, you know, I'm coming to get you and all that shit. Okay. But there's a scene in that. What were we talking about? About the number one movie you saw with black people. Is they love Rocky. He's hunting Russians. Okay. He's just killing them one at a time. And all of a sudden, they show you, like, this fucking horrible set. Like, it's just horrible. They just... <laughs> <clears throat> and they show you a Russian, the best looking white man you ever saw in your life. Blue eyes, blonde hair. He gave Brad Pitt a run for his money. And he's got one of those little Russian hats on. Okay. And he's just looking around. And he's walking back into the wall. And in the wall was Rambo. 
hidden, covered in mud. And you actually see his eyes open up in the mud and Rambo comes out with a knife and stabs the guy. When he came out of the mud, no exaggeration, every black person in that movie theater was three feet off his seat. <laughs> Just immediately? And when they landed, they jumped right up and said, that's our motherfucker. That's our motherfucker. Rambo's my motherfucker. They just all yell, that motherfucker is bad to the bone. That's the baddest white man that ever fucking lived. I mean, they were just going crazy. And every time he shot somebody after that, they went fucking insane. <laughs> they were high-fiving, saying racial slurs. Fucking tremendous. How long into the movie was this? Was it like later into the movie? Well, they started acting up, you know. And- <laughs> <laughs> they started getting loud in the beginning. And I, again, I was not angry at all. Right. I, no, of course not. I you enjoyed, pay extra for it. I enjoyed the narration. I enjoyed the race <laughs> slurs. I enjoyed everything. When he jumped out of the mud, I actually had a look around like, <laughs> walk. They love Rambo. That's it. You know, I've always said that black people like the weirdest things. I still remember the crip that came up to me at the comedy stage. So like, hey, man, he came up with like six fucking guys with ponytails and fucking. And he's like, hey, man, can you do me a favor? I want to be an extra on the longest yard. And I'm like, what? Why? And he goes, man, I love Adam Sam. That's my That's motherfucking. Funny. You're a gangbanger, and you like Adam Sandler. You know, it's so weird. The people they pick up, black people, they just, and you got to love them for it, but they tag on to certain certain white people that can do whatever they want to black people because they love them (laughs) so much, and it's hysterical. I had a black dude that was blacker than night and bolder. All he talked about was the Beatles. The Beatles. Wow. The Beatles. How do you like the Beatles? You're black. (laughs) And Paul McCartney's the shit. I would die. I would fucking go, wow. This tough black dude is a Beatle fucking fan. Woo! You always used to tell, you'd come back and you'd be like, hey man, only three people, like three people asked for you. And all, like you said, like it's always the black dude asked about me. On the and road. I, lo- I want them to. No one comes and says hi to me on the road. I want it. I would love to. That, that I love that. I think that's so cool. There was a black mom that came to my show with her son, and she pulled me over. She's like, "Man, I don't know what you're doing to my son, but he's changing." The other day, I told him something about you got 15 minutes to get to school, and he told me that I had one foot in the grave, one foot out. <laughs> Oh my God! And she, what did she say to that? What do you? I, I'm oh, just she must have lost it. I'm That's just la- amazing. I'm just laughing my ass off because it's like, you know, you never know. You just never fucking know. You just have a good time, <clears throat> and you go out there. I was on the balcony before. I wasn't feeling too good. And I was just thinking. Okay. And I was thinking about. Just being 21 and where my thoughts were. And then I was thinking about like being like, like the last thoughts I had before I became a comedian while I was a civilian, you know? And I was thinking about my life, how when I got divorced, I was, you know, six months into comedy. But once I had gotten on stage, it changed everything for me. And, you know, I think about what really, I don't know, cemented my life as a as a man. And it was comedy. It was doing that whole comedic journey. That comedic journey taught me a lot about myself, taught me a lot about what I wouldn't do. I made a lot of friends. I made a lot of enemies. But that comedic journey for me really got to me. It changed who I was. I didn't know that's what I needed to get the criminal mentality out. And I still remember there was a time when 
like before the store. Like when I got to the store and I got in that fight the first couple of nights, mm-hmm. I had to go home and have a talk with myself and go, you know what? Mitchie liked it. You know, the guy was wrong. You were right. But <clears throat> I got to change that. If I'm going to make it as a comedian, I have to really change all those things about me. And I still remember being broke on a Friday and pulling up to the comedy store at like 11 and seeing that the liquor guy dropped off four cases of Jack Daniels and a case of whiskey. That's 40 bucks a case. That's my Friday. And not once did I think of stealing it. Not once. Because I knew if I stole that, then I would just be the same person I always was. And I didn't want to do that. And yeah, I did stupid things. I, I stole the phones from the from the fucking, uh, you know. Lost, the lost the pound. pound. And shit like that. And that was basically the eat. It wasn't to do drugs or... <clears throat> but it's just weird how the whole comedy... Like, those 15 years really made me a man. Well, like, no one makes a change like that right away. So, like, the the not stealing the booze... I'm not, I'm not saying it's good that you stole the phones. But, like, did, did it start, like... Was that, like, the start of you making the changes? Like, you didn't steal the booze, okay? And then, and then eventually you oh. stopped stealing... Old habits die hard. Yeah. Always remember old habits die hard, especially when you're broke. It's very easy to fall into a pattern when you're broke because you've given the, once you get, let's say you become a carpenter's helper and you're mm-hmm. excited. Someday you're going to make $18 an hour. You're going to be able to build the house. But sometimes it's like, you don't see an end to it. You're just going to see, you're just going to carry fucking wood the rest of your life, you know? Right, yeah. And it breaks you kind of a little bit. A lot. You really fucking think about your future and what you want to do. When I got into comedy, and I was saying it today on the Patreon podcast, that fuck, it was just the change I made and how I made it was so fucking crazy, Lee. Like, it was just so crazy. And yeah, for seven years, for 10 years in LA, I did blow. Okay. I was in LA for 23 years, and for 10 of those years, I did blow, which I was basically lying to myself in in one way or another. But drugs are a part of the fucking comedy mystique. When I got into comedy, it wasn't to fucking be a preacher. It was to be Lenny fucking Bruce, to shoot heroin and fucking fuck dirty strippers and get VD and... (laughs) The goal was not to have a job. Right. I just didn't want a job. There's no way I was going to go work for somebody with a promise of running the place in 10 years. And 10 years is a fucking long time when you're working for something that's not yours. At least with comedy, it's yours. And it's your mistake. And it's your accomplishment. You know? So... It's just fucking weird how I think about things now with comedy. Like, what made me... Lee, I was not going to go to L.A. When you were in Seattle? Is that what you were like? When I was anywhere. When I was anywhere, there was nowhere, no way I was going to L.A. Not only did I end up in L.A., but I walked into the world-famous comedy store. And that was a complete different education you know absolutely and i'm really happy for that i'm really happy that mitzi passed me Mm -hmm. i'm happy about my time struggling at the store and i'm happy about the last seven years at the store you know like they were great compared to when i was there before but it was a real fucking journey man and i loved every step of it lee and i could see how you fell in love with it and how everybody else falls in love with it. Oh, it's um, your buddy George and I were talking about on, on I think Saturday, the first time he came to LA and he took him to the store to see like your name on the wall. Cause George Perez just got his name put on the wall recently in the last couple of years. Like what is that to me seems like the t- like that's always going to be there. What did that feel like? Again, I didn't have a life of accomplishments. You know what I'm saying? 
You know, I graduated high school with Phi Beta Kappa College at North Carolina. That meant just as much as a college degree in comedy. That's like a doctorate. That's more than just a college degree. No, it's a college degree in comedy. At the time when I put it up there, when they put it up there, I was a college student. But it's what what I became since they put my name on there. You know, they put my name on the fucking van. Really? Yeah. Before I left, it was on the fucking van. And I was like, what is and it? It's an accomplishment, but it's not what you were going for. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you never knew about it, so you weren't going for it. I didn't know about my name on the wall before I walked into the comedy store. And I, well, you got it pretty quick. Not, like, too quickly, but you got it fairly quickly, I think, right? Within a month. Within a month. Yeah. And that's that's awesome. I'm not. There's nothing wrong with that at all. No. But just the idea, and frankly... Like, obviously, the store is one of the best clubs in the world. But if any club, like, if I got to a point of comedy where, like, I don't know, that a, a comedy club, I got to be part of, a like, a club almost. That, like, because not many people are on the wall. Like, that, to me, is, like, a dream. Like, that would, that, that would be crazy. That's, like, a I day I'd lot, never forget. I you know there's a lot of people on that wall that didn't do much after that. Got it. Okay. You know, they and didn't do much after that. Was it because they they like f- gave up? Not not gave up, but like thought they had accomplished everything. And uh, I was passed with three people that I was tight with. Okay. I don't know where the girl is. Twenty three years later. Well, yeah, twenty whatever. I got there ninety seven. Twenty seven years later. I lost contact with the girl maybe five years into comedy. I never heard her name again, either in New York. I forget what her name was now. But whenever I would come to Jersey or New York, I would ask about her. And the guy, Larry, we were good friends. Me and him got jobs together at the phone room, at the comedy store, you know. And I don't think he does comedy no more. He's more of an artist. He draws, does paintings and shit like that. I don't know if he sells them, but he does them. That's not, (laughs) you know. So yeah, it's all these. uh, There's so many variables, Lee, and they're so fucking very interesting. And listen, like the last couple weeks, I've gotten into Madonna. Right, real quick, I got to do an ad real quick. And when I come back, we'll get into this Madonna story. I'm going to talk to you people a little bit about DraftKings. Yo, UFC 303 is coming, and DraftKings is on point. Get ready for a full night of big fights and big action. Get in on the fun at DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of the UFC. The light heavyweight title is on the line, and there are tons of other amazing matchups going on. Speaking of amazing, if you're new to DraftKings, listen up. New customers, bet $5. They're going to throw you $150 in bonus bets instantly. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and press code JOEY, J-O-E-Y. That's code JOEY for new customers to get $150 in bonus bets when you just bet $5. It's that simple. Get the big fight feel only. On DraftKings, where the crown is yours, Jack. Remember, five dollars, a hundred and fifty in bonus bets instantly. Use code Joey. Gambling problem? Call one eight hundred Gambler. Or in West Virginia, visit one eight hundred Gambler dot net. In New York, call eight seven seven eight Hope and Y or text Hope and Y four six seven three six nine. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call eight 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 seven eight nine seven 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 or visit ccpg.org. dot org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, twenty one and over. Age varies by jurisdiction. Bonus bets expire one hundred sixty eight hours after issuance. Deposit and eligibility. Restrictions apply. See terms and responsible gaming resources at dkng.co slash MMA. We're back, bitches. Don't forget, download the DraftKings app. I love them. I did good for like three weeks on DraftKings. Really fucking good. 
Oh yeah. Oh my God! It was like every time I go on, they give me an envelope. The 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 fucking uh, the uh, slot machine, Wheel of Fortune. Okay. I would go on there every day to pick up a hundred dollars. Damn! I see. Wow. I like. I got lucky with blackjack this trip. I love that live blackjack in New oh, Jersey. And that last, I had that same money in there for about six fucking weeks. Oh, that feels great. Playing with the same two hundred and fifty dollars, I got it up to like. 14 up to 18 then it went down to nine and then i hit like a 400 dollar fucking bonus it was crazy but then all good things must come when you're hot you're hot when you're cold you're fucking cold so now i give it a break for two weeks then i go back on it oh, yeah, and it was just the 200 bucks that you were playing with yeah it it was in my favor. but we're talking about madonna a couple right. weeks ago, i put this album on by madonna on apple just I was driving, and I'm like, I got to go for a long drive, maybe an hour. I don't want to mess with music. I put Madonna The Essentials on. And within 20 minutes, I was fucking blown away. I was blown away. I listened to Madonna from the 80s, but most importantly, I listened to Madonna's in the 90s. What songs? Madonna made a big fucking splash in 84. Big splash in 83 with her debut album. Then she came back with Like a Virgin. The performance she did at the fucking MTV Music Awards is up there with the greatest live performances I ever seen. She came out with the wedding dress and she fucking stripped down to like a thong and something else at the Radio City Music Hall. It just froze, motherfuckers. It froze me. And... Then when I left New York in 85, if you walk down the street, you saw 10 girls, five of them were dressed like Madonna. Whores were fucking coming out of the woodwork, right? And then I got involved in whatever I was involved in. She put out another album, whatever, True Blue or something. I don't fucking know. And then I went to prison. I got out. I got into comedy. And then when I got into comedy, like right around that time, you you don't remember this. She put out a Pepsi commercial and made Jesus Christ black. Holy shit. White people went off. And then she fucking came out with Justify, the album, the dirty album. And they wouldn't put the video on MTV. And it was Justify My Love. You got to watch that video. I listened to all these songs. The stuff from 2000 is okay. Madonna's fire was from 87 to about 94. Madonna was fucking real. And she was not a musician. She was not a really good singer. Madonna is what you call a fucking artist. Really? Yes. 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 That is a bona fide artist. She didn't put the black Jesus to piss people. She put the black Jesus to... That was... A creative. That's what she wanted to make Jesus, a black dude. And it worked. Like it had a point of oh, view. It, like, yeah. You know, got a hey, reaction. Commercial. She got backlash. But she still remained Madonna. She put a book out of her with naked pictures and shit. You know, when you watch Justify My Love, it's not a video of fucking. It's a bunch of gay dudes dancing around and shit. And it's like, you're like, fucking Madonna was a fucking true artist. There's, there's few people that are really artiste at what they do. You know, Bill Burr, John Mulaney, you know, they're really artiste at what they do. With comedy, we're all artists. We just don't know it. From the beginning, or do you think like it takes a while to become an artist? It is, but it's a, it's a baby artist. You're an embryo. You're a fucking embryo. Whether you're a musician, a painter, you put cans together. You know, you ever go to like a fucking flea market and there's somebody there? Like George's mom was an artist. George, my friend. Right. She was the real deal. She would take fucking wine bottles and put newspaper around them and melt red wax on the newspaper and sell them for 20 bucks. And she would do 10 a week. And take him to a thing, you know. George's that's where George got it from. His mother. Wow. 
There's some people who are real fucking hard. When you when George does a frame for you, it's a work of art. It's not just a frame. George doesn't frame that way. He frames from the artist's perspective. And it's really, really good to see. Would I be talking this shit when I was 30? No. I didn't know what the fucking artist was. <clears throat> Would I be talking this shit when I was 40? No. 50? Maybe. Now? Now I really see it. Who are the people that we thought were just humps or whatever? These motherfuckers belong to something. You know, I saw that Queen got a billion dollars for their music rights. Oh, shit. That means Madonna's going to get two million, two billion. Probably. Madonna's got 30 fucking bona fide hits. Over, yeah, uh, two billion dollars. Two billion. And, and if she so, if she wasn't a good singer, like it was just like the whole package, like that that was so great, like the dancing, like everything put together. And now she looks like Eddie Munster. She got a gold tooth. She sings with a pad, but she's sixty seven. I don't have the balls to do that. She's out there, you know. How do you? And, and that's what you look at. You look at. Even at some part of my career, I saw a little artistry when I was doing the Ari things. Oh, absolutely. I saw a couple things. I was like, you know what? In a different world with a different attitude, I could have been an artist with a little hat with an apple on top and shit and telling people about the village and my friends in Soho. I could have been a fucking artist, but well, I didn't I mean, the right way. It sounds, I can understand where you're like, it sounds kind of like douchey to say artist, but it's not like when, when you said that, when you were talking about that on the way home that night, I just kept thinking like, all I'm really doing right now is just like writing it. And I'm like, just starting to, to add like flair to it. But like the way you use your voice, the way you move around, the way you you move your eyes and your eyebrows, like put together. It's not just one thing. It's not just sitting there reading off a script of a joke you you wrote. It's all of it put together. And that's where I think like the artist comes in. It's like knowing how to put that all together. Because you could be you, you were talking about being an artist with frames. Like you could be an artist with food. Like it seems like you'd really if you take it, it's just more like a love. Like I, I think the, the words are the same. You know, when I went to Onido with Joe three weeks mm -hmm. ago. That wasn't food. That was a work of art. Those charred clams were a work of art. That's an artist chef, you know. The stuffed, uh, the stuffed squid ink mm -hmm. with the lobster tail and cheese on top. That that it, it, that sauce. That's a work of art, you know. Absolutely. And it's like my man said in "Fucking Man on Fire," a man could be an artist. Yeah, Chris, that's great. Yeah. He is an artist and he's about to paint his fucking masterpiece, you know. And yeah. sometimes you're writing a joke, you don't know it's going to be a masterpiece. You know, you don't know where it's going to go. If this is the bit that makes you, that gets you to the next thing, you know, you never know. It's just fucking trying, man. Was there a bit that got like that you think like was a turning point for you? Oh. The fucking Lucy Snowbush. Oh, story. the story. Okay, yeah. The uh, beating the hooker up and stealing the wig. That was the biggest turning point of my career. Really? And the dumbest. No, <laughs> no jurisdiction. You know, just you do movies, you do TV shows. You think you develop a following? Nothing. You tell a story about mugging a hooker and letting her lighting a wig on fire, people start buying tickets. Remember the first time I sold the show after that story? I sold 150 tickets at the, that fucking place on Wilshire. It's, it's still there. The pe the guy had the pizza parlor, and he sold. He did comedy. Right. I can't remember the name, but I, you know, <clears throat> he sold bread there and shit. He did comedy next to bread or something. I don't know. Oh, do you want me to say it? I think I remember it. Or do you not want me to say it? I don't give a fuck. Sal's? Sal's, yeah. Sal's. Sal's Comedy Hall. Yep. I had Sal's Comedy Hall. And, and what were you selling before this, if you sold 150 tickets that day? 32. 
35, 40 on a weekend, you know. I still remember working with a booker. All those bookers early on, they would book you for a number, and one of the two shows they booked you for would not exceed their sales. And then they try to talk you down. And right. you, you know, what What are your options? Okay, I'll take 500. I was supposed to get 800, but I'll take five or I'll take four. I'll never forget, I went to Orlando. It was Orlando in Tampa. This Spanish promoter chick brought me down there. She goes, I put a thing out, and you were the number two requested comic behind Angel Salazar. So the first night, it was tremendous. Orlando was like fucking 150 people, you know. The next night in Tampa was like 32. Oh, no. And it was time to pay me at like 1 in the morning. This lady kept fucking beating around the bush. And I'm like, listen. And she was with her son. I go, listen. <clears throat> when your son fights because he was a fighter, I go, they tell him what they're going to make. If they don't do the gate, he still gets the money. Mm -hmm. And she goes, you're right. And she went to the ATM and paid me the 800 or whatever. And I felt bad. Because it wasn't her fault. It was my fault in a way. You know, you didn't I, didn't know it or? I didn't know how to promote. At that time, it was MySpace or some shit, you know. <clears throat> we were all confused. Everybody thought just by going on MySpace that you became a star like Dane Cook. Nobody knew there were steps to it. Like there was things you had to do, return uh, messages and all this shit, you know. And I always think about that. Like... Hmm. Whose fault was that that night? Because the first night I did great. Mm -hmm. The second night they might have been, there was a UFC. Oh, okay. There was a UFC. But I always did great during UFCs. You know, some of the best shows I sold out were doing the UFC, especially when McGregor fought. I always sold out when McGregor fought. It's fucking you like, I'm not going to sell any tickets. No. So it's really how you look at things sometimes, like how you go into them going, well, what do you got this week, Cock Licker? This week I, on Sunday, the 30th, I'm at the uh, Comedy Connection in Providence. And you have nothing? And you're headlining that night? No. I will, it's, a, it's, a, it's a showcase show. I don't know where I'm going up on it. Very um, good. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. And then if you, this is two weeks away, but July 5th and 6th, I'm in Saratoga at the Comedy Works. So if you're there for July 4th weekend. Come on out. Okay. This week, I think I'll be at the Comedy Dojo one night. Nice. And then I'll... next week is July the 3rd on a Wednesday. I'd like to be somewhere that night. You know, like a good sh comedy show before people take off from town and whatever. Oh, yeah. It's so fun seeing you go up there. Especially, like, and I get it. I'm not trying to get you to do more. But, like, when you're doing it and you're having fun doing it, it's just fun. It's it's it, you look so free and like you're having so much fun up there. I'm having a lot of fun. When I do it once a week or once every two weeks, it becomes a blast for me. It's a hobby. I give it 100%. I think it's shit. You know, it's really fucking tremendous. But I don't I'm, know how you do that. You, you'll you be talking about stuff on the car ride up or in the green room, and three minutes later, you have 15 minutes on it. <clears throat> You just break it down, man. You just break it the fuck down. I've been doing this for so long. I miss that, Lee. I miss that. For a while, my mind went dead to writing new jokes. I couldn't pick that. And now, at least I'm seeing things again, you know? And Oh, yeah. <clears throat> the worst thing ever is when your mind goes blank and you can't fucking write anymore, you know? But we did okay. But I'm really proud of you. Thank you, buddy. I got to watch you Saturday night, and you were you surprised me more than I thought. Hey, what happened? I could tell you're putting the work in. I could tell you sticking to a system. And it's just working, brother, and I'm very proud of you. That means the world, dude. I'm having just the talks with you after. Everyone who brings me out, it just, I'm having a blast. It's, I don't know what else to say. Thank you. 
Just keep doing what you're doing, and I'll see you next week, cocksucker. Love you, buddy. Feel better. Love you. Have a great week. The check-in is brought to you by Blue Chew. Listen, we all know it's not about the size of the boat. It's the motion of the ocean. So let Blue Chew help you get shipwrecked. Blue Chew gets your dick hard so you can have great sex. It's as simple as that, right? They're an online service that sends ED medicine to your door. The tablets are chewable, taste like mint, and will get you in the mood in no time. Tip. Top Magoo. It's got the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but at a fraction of the price. You can't mess this up. Listen, it's summertime. Everybody wants to slink things in the summer. Everybody wants to be John Travolta and the chick from Greece in the summer. But, you know, sometimes you drink, sometimes the sun. Your dick don't work that good. You always want to be prepared, whether you're 20 or or fucking 60. You want to be ready for war at all times. It's easy. Getting started is really easy with Blue Chew. Just head to bluechew.com, talk to one of the licensed medical providers, and if you're approved, you'll have a prescription in days. They send it right to your door, and even your mailman don't know what's in the box. Nobody will know what's in that magic box. Only you, when your smile lights up and going, oh my God, I'm going to a slinging dick festival. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at BlueChew.com. Chew it and do it, Jack. Check-in listeners can try Blue Chew free. What are you talking about, Joey? Free when you press in promo code Diaz at checkout. D-I-A-Z, and you just pay $5 for shipping. Who's better than Blue Chew? Nobody. That's why BlueChew.com, promo code Diaz, D-I-A-Z, to receive your first month for free. And trust me, after you get that first month and you see how great life is, you'll be a Blue Chew fan for life. So visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And I want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the show and spreading the love. Support the show and try Blue Chew for free. Just $5 for shipping. Use promo code Diaz. Let's get this show started, fellas.